good morning very good morning to one and all i welcome all of you on behalf of konya society of india so uh, i'll start with uh, my talk on teresium and cataract surgery i know it's uh, quite simple uh, thing for all of us uh, uh, this talk is mainly for uh, general ophthalmologist comprehensive ophthalmologist feel free to give your inputs here cataract surgery is already a refractive surgery and the outcomes as well as the technique has been refined so much that the the outcomes are so much predictable so can teresium surgery also be a refractive surgery well let's see when do we operate the teresium there are certain indication of teresium when we need to operate that when it's significantly large in uh, size like more than 2 mm on the cornea when there is a corneal astigmatism there when there is progression towards visual axis cosmetically patient okay thank you uh wants uh, any symptomatic relief or there is any restriction in ocular motility we have to remember before it reaches visual axis we should do the surgery because whenever it increases in the size it leads to significant irregularity and refractive changes and by that time we possibly would have lost uh, a chance to operate a, a clean cut case uh, some of the groups suggested that when there is more than 45% of the radius uh, horizontal radius from center of the cornea to the limbus uh, we should do or in uh, in short central 3.2 mm of visual axis when if it's involved it's better to do it off there beyond that it may not uh, serve the purpose and beyond that it may not be very predictable so when we are planning cataract surgery along with teresium surgery you know, the first thing comes biometry so what do we do keratometry corneal topography unfortunately keratometry is not the best technique uh, for teresium related cataract cases because a uh, teresium being uh, a fleshy tissue on the surface leads to unstable tear film and hence uh, the mires may not be very accurate however in keratometry you do get some reading which may not be very accurate in that case topography actually gives you much better outcome and detects the curvature of entire cornea and even smaller irregularity can also be detected among topography also we know that placidus based topographer are based on the principle of first percentage image which comes from the reflection from the tear film hence uh, small tear film abnormality which are quite common with teresium may get quite uh, annoying in terms of your keratometric outcome whereas schimpflug base uh, topographer would do better in that sense it does not mean that everybody needs to undergo schimpflug base topography but if you have it in cataract uh, surgery uh, uh, with the teresium this is something which is very interesting and important topographically uh, teresium normally leads to with the rule astigmatism however uh, when the teresium increases in size it can lead to quite significant irregular astigmatism sometimes as you can see from uh, here the the um, astigmatism is quite asymmetric and um, asymmetric astigmatism gives quite asymmetric results the induced astigmatism earlier in cases of early teresium is reversible but when the scarring increases uh, these things may not remain that uh, reversible so what do we do first do we do both of them together or we do teresium first and uh, cataract together i'm going to give you an example one of uh, such case had significant teresium uh, was posted for teresium surgery and look at the topography post operatively pre operatively apparently there was 8.3 diopter astigmatism and if you do not do topography and if you just uh, do keratometry you possibly would end up uh, missing out an asymmetric astigmatism here quite significantly asymmetric and post operatively it reduced to 1.6 diopter now not only that there is a reversal of topography here and in the same area there is almost change of 13 diopter post teresium surgery so such kind of significant astigmatism if we try to treat it without uh, taking care of teresium it's definitely not a great idea so sequence uh, surgery where we do teresium first uh, it's better because of better stability of uh, corneal curvature 
a high predictability of IL power calculation and it allows cornea to heal completely. So when do we do first? Well, always best practice do pterygium first, larger pterygiums, affecting vision, inducing astigmatism, pterygium first. When do we do simultaneous? Do we do simultaneous? Preferably not, but sometime if pterygium is very small, older age patient, you may not want to do multiple surgeries, low astigmatism, regular myers on your keratometry, we still can do it. So simultaneous surgery, small pterygia, older patients, reduce hospital visit, and if the cost is uh, a factor, we can think of that. So what's the time gap between, ideal time gap between pterygium and the cataract? Ideally, whenever you do pterygium surgery followed by the cataract, you have to make sure your topography as well as keratometry is stabilized. So keep measuring topography at uh, uh, various follow-ups. Typically, a smaller pterygium, 2 to 4 millimeter a month is good, but make sure you check the topography and if it's stable, then you go ahead and uh, do the month, uh, pterygium surgery. So if the pterygium is smaller, uh, it's fine, 2 to 4 millimeter is fine, more than 2 to 4 millimeter, more than 2 millimeter, well, you might have to wait for 3 months and if the pterygium is very large and if it's extending into pupillary area, well, you must do pterygium surgery first. Make sure the ocular surface is stable, make sure your topography is stable, make sure there are no scarring and if you have scarring, you might want to take care of that by your PTK or whatever laser procedure you want to do and following which you plan a uh, cataract surgery. So can pterygium affect the biometry? Certainly it can affect biometry because the larger pterygium can affect the center part of the cornea also so that 3 millimeter zone uh, can get affected. One uh, nice uh, study uh, by Mustafa and colleague and showed that pterygium size can affect the lens power calculation. So if the pterygium size which is calculated uh, from the limbus uh, to the head of the uh, pterygium, if pterygium is more than 2 millimeter up to uh, 2 to 4 millimeter, well 0.5 diopter change can occur in IL power calculation. More than 4 millimeter, it's better to take care of the pterygium first and do not assume anything. So sometime if the pterygium is less, you may end up uh, in change in keratometric uh, value and you might have to choose 0.5 diopter less than the most emetropic power which you have selected. This is to compensate for the change in the keratometry what you do. So are there any change in the surgical technique? Uh, uh, of course not, we can do the regular surgery but we probably would avoid extra capsular or SICS because we do not want to affect the limbus there which might be required for the uh, pterygium surgery or previously pterygium surgery would have damaged that limbus, we may not want to go in that site. So ideally, well, we operate from the opposite side of the pterygium and if it's a bi-headed pterygia, we take care of that first and then put an incision superiorly. Uh, to improve the visibility, we uh, can use Tripan Blue. Choice of IOL is simple, well you can uh, take care of uh, any IOL of your choice provided uh, you are not dealing with significant astigmatism. If there is irregular astigmatism, uh, certainly you would want to wait. So when you do pterygium excision, repeat uh, keratometry topography 4 to 6 weeks, repeat one more time, 2 weeks apart. If there is no change, well you can surely go ahead with uh, your regular uh, IOL power calculation. No significant astigmatism, no demonstrable higher order aberration, no central corneal scarring, any IOL is fine. But uh, if you have regular astigmatism, you can think of a toric IOL also. But the large pterygia with high degree of corneal aberration, you may not want to do your uh, multifocals uh, here or torics here. So one such case uh, with that I will be uh, finishing that you can see there preoperatively there was astigmatism which was little high. but post uh, pterygium surgery not only it uh, reduces but it actually becomes pretty uniform cornea. So small looking pterygia which are quite inconspicuous still may do quite significant uh, change on the ocular surface. Thank you very much. Thank you Himanshu. Uh, any comments from the audience, any questions? So, so how many times do you combine and how many times do you do sequential? You do a lot lot of pterygiums and cataract as well. You, you can use the microphone here.
highly atrophic and often do not require surgery unless if there's a small element of cosmosis, which again in our population, at least the clients I see, it's very uncommon to have a very tiny pterygium that actually requires only pterygium surgery or with a cataract. So most of them, almost all, I would do a sequential Sequential. procedure. Yes. And for those who do them simultaneously, do you finish your cataract surgery first and then address the pterygium or you do the pterygium first and then go and do the cataract surgery? Himanshu, carry them first. Halfway, like I, I cleared the head of the pterygium from the cornea, leaving it aside. I finish up the cataract surgery, hydrate the wound, then I finish up the uh, pterygium that graft simultaneous grafting grafting simultaneous. Then I do the grafting part. Yeah, I think this is again a point. Yes, yeah. Why don't you use the microphone? Please clarify on toric lenses where to put, where not to put. <coughs> toric lens, I think. What? Uh, yeah. Yes. Correct. Yeah. We have to understand that the pterygium surgery per se can have post-operative problems. When you remove the pterygium, large pterygium from the cornea, the epithelium has to heal. And combining an external surgery with an internal surgery, where you have entry into the eye, sometimes it may not be. It may be more for your convenience saying that why to do two, you can do it at one shot. But it's not great. And I have had personal experience where I had to operate. So I was focusing so much on the pterygium to do the pterygium excision and put a conjunctival autograph that I did not keep my corneal surface moist. And by the time I went back to do my cataract surgery, the corneal epithelium had desiccated so much that even visualization to do a capsular axis had become very difficult. So I think if you're going to do that, you have to put generous amount of HPMC on the surface to keep the surface moist. But ideally, left to me, I would prefer to do them sequential and not combined. Yeah. Only thing is that, yeah. So if you have a pterygium and you have astigmatism, don't go ahead and put a toric IOL because if you did that, then when you remove the pterygium, it will be a mess. I think I'll start. Okay. Now, on this, we'll be talking on uh, cataract and dry eye diseases. This is, uh, can I have my slides, please? Again, this is again a very basic and simple topic of cataract surgery and dry eye. Cataract surgery, we know, is the most commonly performed surgery. It's minimally invasive, and we are looking at more and more improved outcomes, and as, at the same time with increased patient expectation. What happens, even in my practice, we, have, we do a cataract surgery. Day one, patient is very happy, thanks you, and you know, his vision is great. And sometimes a week or two later, the same patient will be back to your clinic and start complaining about, besides vision, he'll start complaining about pain and about you know, all kind of difficulties with regular day-to-day -day activities. And, they always blame it to the cataract surgery. They say, before cataract surgery, I was perfectly fine. Even they would have had this, but they wouldn't have noted it. But now, because they have undergone a surgery, they expect all their symptoms to disappear. And then they are in your clinic, and they are trying to relate that this has all happened because of the cataract surgery. And we know that dry eye is basic in alteration of the tear film of the ocular surface. And this can result in dryness, burning sensation, foreign body sensation, blurred vision that clears on blinking. And it affects your day-to-day -day work and the direct impact on quality of patient's life. And one of these studies uh, have shown that it's almost similar to the impact of a moderate angina. 
and studies looking at multifocal performance of multifocal eye oval, they say that the tear film is the most important uh, refracting surface of the eye and that can really affect the outcome. And dry eye sometimes happen because of the neural arc being, uh, you know, suppressed. You basically, if your corneal sensation is reduced, that can have uh, alteration in the quality of tears that's being produced. So, and a lot of times we also have to look at the surface toxicity of medication. We tend to use a lot of medications perioperatively, both pre-op and post-op, and also the surface damage associated with the surgical procedure. So during the surgery, if you don't take care to protect the surface, that can also induce surface changes. Now looking at uh, some of the impact of uh, cataract surgery, uh, they, you find that the symptoms usually worsen up to three months' time. You know, this is a questionnaire which was where you look at before and after surgery, you find that the scores for the ocular pain uh, at three months are much higher than the, the lower the score, the more the symptoms. And also looking at the ocular surface disease index, also we find all the parameters of ocular discomfort, visual function, they all worsen by three, up, up to three months. Even the lower tear meniscus or fluorescent staining, which we usually don't try to take a look at, if you were to analyze, you find that there is definitely a worsening. So it is not like the patient is imagining these symptoms. There are certain changes that take place on the surface after cataract surgery. Even the tear film stability and the Shermer's test also show a reduction, and it takes almost three to six months to go back to pre-op level. And looking at this study where they looked at impression cytology, they found a reduction in the goblet cell density as well. Now, what, what these studies have shown that the symptoms of dry eye does happen in cataract surgery patient. It appears at one week post-op and peaks at one month. We need to identify and treat them early rather than say that the patient, you're just imagining it and this is not something uh, that's present. Uh, and misuse of eye drops is, I think, a major pathologic factor related to dry eye. Often we use a combination of steroid antibiotic and we try to use the same thing for a period of somewhere six to eight weeks and a lot of this is unsupervised where it is, because your surgery has become minimally invasive, you don't need so much of medication. So you cannot follow a regime that you were following for your extracapsular cataract surgery and continue. So this is kind of being overcautious. And a lot of times surgeons start topical antibiotics three days prior to surgery as well. And uh, even the patients who are diabetic, they find that the changes are much more pronounced. Uh, and this study uh, published in 2010 looked at the role of cyclosporin and this by reducing the surface inflammation improved the tear uh, function in patients who underwent multifocal lens implantation. And also looking at various factors that can affect, they again found that the cataract surgery time, the duration of light exposure was the only factor that had significant correlation. The incision location and shape did not have anything to do with, but we know that uh, the, the larger the incision may be, it has a greater impact on the corneal sensation as compared to the 2.2, 2.8 incision that we do. In terms of management, I think we need to identify the problem, address the severity, prevent further damage, and treat judiciously. There are already preoperatively certain risk factors, especially in terms of age. You know that in females, because of hormonal changes, there is a greater chance of having dry eye. Systemic, associated systemic disease, a lot of patients are already on antihypertensive, and because of the kind of environment that we live in, a lot of people are also taking antihistamines. So, and <coughs> low humidity condition, that means you're always in an air-conditioned environment. And these can all have an impact on your tear film and its quality. So when you see your patient prior to cataract surgery, do a surface staining just to see whether there is any, because we only focus on the cataract, we don't look at it. But if you put a drop of fluorescent in the cul-de-sac and just look at it, you can look at the tear film stability, look at tear film breakup time, and look at whether there is any surface staining. If you look at the lid margin, in invariably 70 to 75 percent will have some mebumen gland dysfunction, which is very common uh, in our hot and humid environment. Also look at the position of the lid. A lot of time there is lid laxity, there is some amount of pre-existing conjunctivocalysis, which can also impact your uh, dry eye uh, post-operatively. And look at the drops that you use. If they, it contains, because a lot of these antibiotics and all, they all contain benzalkonium chloride as a preservative especially the generic ones, what you have. And this can have an impact because it, it, the benzalkonium chloride basically prevents microbial contamination of the medication and it enhances the penetration of the drug by loosening the integrity of the epithelial cells. 
but this can also have an impact on your tear function and it reduces the tear film breakup time. There are two studies done by Dr. Vasavada back in 2008 looking at, you know, using uh, moxifloxacin uh, one day prior to surgery and just using it two hours before surgery. They found that the concentration in the aqueous humor in both the groups were exactly the same. And the second arm of the study, they looked at the conjunctival flora. You know, they took swabs and they tried to do the culture and they found that whether you use it one day prior or you just use it two hours before, the, the, the reduction of the conjunctival flora is just the same. So it doesn't make sense to pre-treat the patient several days uh, before. So basically, identify the pre-existing dry eye and ocular surface damage, improve tear film stability, counsel patients pre-operatively. If you tell your patients before surgery itself that you're undergoing a surgery, you'll be using a lot of medications and you may have some symptoms of dry eye which may persist for some time and you'll have to use tear substitutes. I think your patient will be more receptive post-operatively when this problem happens. If you don't convey this beforehand, they think that this was never there and this has suddenly cropped up. And minimize surgical trauma to the ocular surface. I always like to use HPMC to protect my corneal surface during my cataract surgery and I find that this does have an impact where my patients are much more comfortable post-op. Judicious use of perioperative medication. Don't unnecessarily use antibiotics for a very long period of time. You have a small incision, it heals. We are slowly moving on to an in a direction where people are looking at using no drops after cataract surgery. They're trying to just give intraoperatively one shot. And I think if you focus more on, uh, you know, uh, sterile techniques and using povidone iodine pre-surgery uh, pre to uh, disinfect the surface, I think that should be pretty good. And you manage the dry eye situation post or Don't just, you know, bombard them with a lot of lubricants and say this is what it is. Try to see if there is a specific uh, reason why they are having it. Sometimes even the systemic medication that take that, that's impacting the surface. I think educating the patient, counseling them will go a long way in that. So thanks, thanks for a patient hearing. Ajay, uh, do you have any question, any experience? Any points to? Sometimes uh, you can pre-treat your patients, give them hot fermentation, try to address the meibomian gland dysfunction and sometimes starting them on a tear substitute before surgery I think really helps by, by the time they have surgery and come out of it they are much more comfortable. Actually, uh, I had an example, uh, so even the biometric calculation Biometric calculation sometimes is effective and too adapted actually. I have an example. And also I follow the rule that in secondary chagrin, uh, never try a premium I will. Because I have, I have a patient picture of it. I put multifocal. That patient is following up with me for more, almost now 14 years. In the meantime, she developed cataract. I put multifocal. Restore that time come in the market first. And within two years, the surface is totally vascularized because of that arthritis reason only. So, never put any multiple. Now she is blaming me. Why I put this? Uh, there is no reason. Okay, because you start. Uh, good morning and welcome everyone. So, uh, after this, I'm going to uh, talk on. Can I have my slides, please? So, a uh, comparatively rare thing, but when it happens, it's really a nightmare. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share three, four cases that I had compiled a couple of years back, and I'll take you through those cases that how the cases were managed. So, we all are good cataract surgeons, and, and we want to see our patient 2020 next day on first day. But if on first day your eyes looks, patient eye looks something like this, you'll be concerned, and you'll need uh, retina surgeon help. But if your first day is pretty good, that's 2020, and after a few weeks or a few, few days, the cornea looks something like that, you'll be really scared, or something like this. You'd never want this for your routine cataract surgery patients. So, so that's what I'm going to highlight in next uh, for six, seven minutes or so. So first case is, this 50-year-old gentleman underwent uneventful fecal emulsification and uh, PCOL foldable elsewhere. And uh, as per records, he was 6'9 on first postoperative week. He was on uh, topical steroids and antibiotics. Uh, on 
second week the primary surgeon noticed something something weird in the stomal area where there he had made a tunnel so at for that and at that time he had redness and dimness of vision and he was referred when uh, i saw him first he was 618 there was some congestion and multiple pinpoint you can see this there were these pinpoint infiltrates in the tunnel area these were only in tunnel area and these were not crossing the limbus so what we decided was we labeled it a, a tunnel infection in i went talked to the primary surgeon he said that there i on first week i saw that there was something some cortical matter maybe behind the tunnel so that's what he thought that there is a cortical metal which with time will dissolve uh, but actually it was an infiltrate so we took a scraping from the floor of the tunnel there was no organism on gram or koh because it uh, it was like late onset we decided that it will be a slow growing organism started on day one uh, or with voriconazole and moxifloxacin this i think around 10 years back this case presented to us after five days of therapy the infiltrate actually increased by this time there was fungus that was grown on several axis agar it was aspergillus and we thought that now let's bombard it with whatever best possible antifungal medication we have that included systemic even intracameral injections but it kept on worsening you can see this the density and extent has increased and now the hyperpion has also come so uh, then i thought that maybe we can try m4b also so whatever antifungal medication it was not responding it was worsening this was the first fungal first tunnel infection of fungal that i dealt with in my practice around 10 years back and at this juncture we thought that actually it is increasing there is no point in waiting let's go ahead and do a patch graft in that area a uh, full thickness patch graft was done and uh, you can see at the end of the surgery or oh, whatever antifungal medication so i, I thought that may, maybe i'll inject m4b and then I kept him on systemic antifungal for three weeks when there was no no uh, sign of recurrence started steroids and then he started uh, improving as you see uh, after three weeks i started steroids and patient did pretty well and after six months he was doing well and there was no recurrence in the second case uh, she had uh, also had these you can see this multiple pinpoint uh, infiltrates which appeared two weeks after uh, cataract surgery and was referred and despite uh, this was also fungal and despite all fungal antifungal medication just like our first case is kept on worsening and again had to taken up for therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty fortunately uh, the limbus was not involved so it was within the limbus it, it has not grown uh, gone into the sclera and it did pretty well after three months the patient i was saved and the vision also restored why i am again and again highlighting the part of limbus is uh, uh, for it is because of this case number three this lady had undergone temporal sics and then on the 20th day or so then she felt that there was some pain that is watering and she was referred when i saw her first this was the picture so there was infiltrate in SICS whole tunnel, which included limbus as well as sclera. So uh, she had the aspergillus flavors, and despite everything, whatever we could do, it you you can see that it on day three it was increasing. So I thought that there is no point in uh, waiting, and this was like before this I had already seen two tunnel infections. Like this was I think three years after I'd seen the first uh, tunnel infection. So I uh, didn't wait much and planned a therapeutic graft, big one. Uh, corneoscleral one you can see this limbus is also involved so you can see on first day it seemed okay but on seventh day there was a recurrence in the on from a scleral area and it kept on increasing you can see on day eight and then there was membrane that there was associated endophthalmitis also we gave some intravitreal voriconazole m4v whatever but ultimately the eye went into thysis last case so this this person had presented again 22 days after phaco emulsification and this on scraping was nocardia and this uh, i started with cefazolin and moxifloxacin uh, but to this only it responded pretty well so you can see that in we have seen now four cases one was bacteria three were fungal and the bacteria one uh, that it we could manage medically pretty easy there was some med that was taken care of with the tabcl but in fungal tunnel infections these three cases were there two were clear corneal phacoemulsification wound one was sics wound so both all three uh, i had to intervene surgically and two could be saved the one where the fungus has crossed the limbus could not be salvaged so 
if you see the literature, there was this case who uh, reported from All India, All India uh, Ames, and this lady had a fungal tunnel infection which responded to medical management. So if you see the whole literature, most of the cases which, you know, uh, tunnel infection, they are, if they are bacterial, they are slow growing organism like the cardia or microsporidia or, and, but, uh, or fungal. The fungal ones, in most of these cases, you have to intervene surgically. So they are not very good and, you know, if you see this study, this, these are all uh, bacteria and all were healed and only one required any surgical intervention. So you can have a tunnel infection both at main port as well as side port. So you need to see if the suspected cause, I tried to analyze all these cases, I talked to the primary uh, surgeon in detail. So mm, there was one thing that I you noticed in few uh, two of two surgeons, they were using reusable blades. They were keeping, this was around 10 years uh, back, uh, one surgeon was using the even the microkeratome and uh, crescent in formalin chamber. So I thought that there is definitely some breach in sterilization we'll have to look into, look back and see where the things have gone wrong. But it is very important to pick up the early signs. In case if you see there is something wrong, so you need to pay, you should have a very low threshold to you know, discuss with your cornea colleagues and see what best can be done. Thank you so much. Thank you Vikas for a wonderful uh, presentation and a nice summary. So I think the take home message in this case is that if you see something wrong in your phaco wound, don't wait for it to spontaneously get better. So the earlier we can intervene, the earlier we can arrive at a diagnosis, maybe it can uh, improve the prognosis because if you wait too long I, 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 and if you're dealing with a fungus or something, you can see that you know the, long, the, the, the later the patient presents to you, the management becomes more and more complicated. Stromal injection, that the case that I showed you, that was reported from RP Center, up, up. they had given uh, all this. But see, if we see the voriconazole molecule per se, it has a very good uh, penetration, even with topical. So for me, I don't think there is any role of uh, intrastromal one. Or the only thing is, you can give some loading dose for some time. It is going to stay there for 20 minutes or so, not more than that. And now we have an RCT also, which has compared both intrastromal and topical. So for me, I, I what, don't think... Uh, yeah. One of the points if we see any infection, whether it's a post-LASIK infection under a flap or a infection post dissec or infection post dalk, anything which is in an interface, usually the infections are difficult to treat and often require surgical intervention. Yeah. So I think our threshold for, like he said, that unless you have proven bacterial where we have a good armament of, you know, antimicrobials that we can treat, I think I would go ahead and do a surgical intervention much earlier than rather than wait for medical therapy. Yes. And these, these patients are on steroids also. Correct. So, so that makes it that even program. worse. We will move on to the next topic which is again uh, corneal edema post cataract surgery which is again a common problem that we face. This is I will be talking for next uh, few minutes about DM detachment during cataract surgery. So it is uh, not so uncommon and uh, small DMD is also evident but when it is uh, total or central that is the concern with us. It can happen even after femtocataract both from the main site and via side ports and some inherent corneal pathology is also responsible for this. So let's start with our first case. Otherwise beautiful surgery, watch carefully during hydration of the wound from the left side ports. So what has happened? Beautiful picture. Beautiful. You cannot achieve this kind of big bubble in your during your dial surgery. So next step, the surgeon, it is a central 8 millimeter. I was not the surgeon. Surgeon is a cataract surgeon. He just put little amount of air and that actually did the whole job. So next uh, day, it is day one and it was fine. And this is another surgery, surgeon was me. You, again, you look, side port is a common site. If you look carefully in the left side port, this was about 
seven, eight years back. You see the fluid wave. The difference is from the first one, it was central eight millimeter. This is from one end of the limbus. It spread it to the other end. So, how did I manage that time? So I naturally this side it has not happened. So I thought I was in the uh, below the desmet, but actually not. I was in the interface. So you see that interface because it was not moving. The air is not moving to the opposite limbus. So I, I realized that I was in the interface. So I remove. I started remove it from the main port again. I use the main port. But again, I was in the interface. I was in the interface. So again, I removed the air. I removed the air. The I, I used a 30 gauge needle and entered from the 6 o'clock through a long tract. Now I am in the right position just below the DM. And I see the part of the air still what left in the, that was in the interface, which I left in the anterior, in between, uh, from the main port. I checked with the needle. Now the whole air is behind the DM and you can see the DM folds at the center. DM folds at the center, I increase the air tamponade. So it is a tight uh, tamponade. Close down, keep the patient outside. And you see this is the day one. This is about eight, nine years. That time I didn't have the anterior uh, segment OCT. So this, you see that this triradiate sign actually is the thing. And this is after 21 days and the patient was fine. This was a post-op. The, the, uh, this surgeon referred to me for uh, DSEC and otherwise grossly healthy. So next step is if you have anterior segment OCT, you, s you can see the beautiful uh, detachment and try to find out the area where DM is attached. If you look carefully that superior cut, this part DM is completely attached. So your management should start from that point. So here, the next day, this is only air assisted. You see the edema is in the almost 80% of lower part, but this part is relatively clear. I put a separate wound, put injection, and gradually increase the tamponade. You can use the 30 gauge needle also. And when you feel that sufficient uh, tightness is there, you could check and then wait for a few minutes. It is just like, and 60 minutes after you see the cornea is clear and you take the patient back into the OT. I just follow the principle of like putting the air for 45, to, uh, 45 minutes to one hour, remove the epithelium because it was edematous. Again, this sign is important when total DM detachment is again like Mercedes Benz sign. So I remove almost 40% of the ER, keep the thing, uh, some ER in between and keep the, send the patient back home, put a suture and you see the after four hours, this was the picture and this was the anterior segment OCT, the DM is attached. So after six days, the vision is 6, 6, and 6. This is another patient, FECO attempted. Surgeon called me over phone that I have not entered with FECO. Just I gave the incision and this has happened. Only the main port was done. You see that this was the picture. Surgeon entered only with the main port. This is the main port. 
I am in, but whole DM is detached from limbus to limbus. So I put a 30 gauge needle, I pierced the DM, entered into the anterior chamber. This was just one and a half years back. Trying to create adequate tamponade. In fact, when I look the patient's other eye, the patient has PPCD, posterior polymorphous corneal dystrophy. That is the only dystrophy where DM is so loose, if you attempt FECO, that there may be uneventful, even in the next day or after seven days you will find. So this total tamponade checked. Uh, during year I just checked that DM is totally attached and after some time I removed the, uh, using only 30 gauge needle, I didn't touch the cataract. After uh, three, four months, I did the cataract. This is the picture, two years. And this is the another patient similar, just only focal DM detachment, you see, other part is clear. ASOCT picture, you see, there's the area of detachment. So you have to approach from this area. This is up after next day morning you see so this is after five days and this is a patient surgery done two and a half years back corneal edia dm detachment only in central region still you can fix this with air and you see this is the picture after air bubble only and this is the specular and this similar case published in archives 10 years back DM detachment and it was fixed with C3F8. So don't get panicked, keep cool, try to locate attached area DM with care. In case of any doubt, close the wound, immediate ASOCT. Also in late cases, go for anterior segment OCT. Select the area for air injection via new port or 30G needle. Keep full chamber air for one to two hours. I do not use C3F8 or F6 unless it is record. And DM detachment can be fixed even after months. Air is a powerful instrument. Thank you very much. Interesting presentation. Could you give some tips as to how to avoid this situation? Avoid during the most of the time it happens during hydration of the side ports or main ports. So your direction of the needle is very important. So if your direction is towards the anterior chamber, sometimes it is a problem. So your direction of the needle in the mid stromal region and more towards the limbus, not towards the anterior chamber. That is one thing and avoid blunt instrument during giving the side portings. <coughs> In most of the cases, you have an inkling that the dust is friable, it is loose by the time you finish your FECO. So why not use an air bubble and hydrate the main wound and remove the air bubble and then hydrate the side port? Normally, it is not required. Most of the only if we suspect, the only we know now that from cornea point of view, PPCD, posterior polymorphous corneal dystrophy, the cornea is, uh, you will see a lot of literature reports, spontaneous DM detachment three days after operation. So one this thing, a bilateral even. One of the things that is quite common if you're doing cataract <coughs> surgery and if you're using knives which are not very blunt, <coughs> I think in, in your main port you will always see a small DM detachment that's there. It's, that's fairly common. So I think, uh, so because you see the DM detachment, you are very careful and you take care not to but in the side port, often you just put in your candle and you just hydrate just to make it watertight. So like he mentioned, that the, the more deeper your candle is, that means the more closer it is to, it's to the decimus membrane, the chance of deta detachment would be higher. So try and avoid doing that. Yes, Suvira, you wanted to add some point. Himanshu, if you can come up.
complete AFL, watch out for pupillary block because we have seen cases where the surgeon has attempted doing a DM repair using a complete AFL but has not paid attention to dilate the pupil and the patient has gone in for a pupillary block with 360 degree peripheral sinic and it become much more difficult to manage. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can not even a minute or two, you can leave it for an hour, nothing happens. You give the oral diamox to the patient, keep it for an hour, an hour later you can go back and decompress the anterior chamber by the time you also dilate the pupil and you can leave about a 70-80% air fill, that's sufficient. Yeah. No, 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 no. Fine. Okay. So, Himanshu will be again covering a topic on cataract surgery post keratoplasty. So, I don't think we have time. So, I'm going to just uh, take you through a video uh, of uh, post uh, um, keratoplasty cataract uh, surgery. So, basically post cataract uh, uh, post keratoplasty cataract surgery can be combined where you have significant cataract uh, during uh, PK peak where you uh, cannot uh, do anything else. The advantage of combining is, well, you don't avoid any injury to the endothelium. You can handle any grade of cataract. But disadvantage, well, biometry may be very poor. It can be un predictable refractive outcome. It's an open globe, vitreous prolapse, and it's not very easy to put uh, uh, premium IOLs there. So when do we do sequential? Preferably where there is no cataract or minimum cataract. The advantage, well, it's a controlled surgery. It's a more like a refractive surgery. You can use toric IOLs. It's a closed chamber uh, surgery, and I would rather prefer that. Disadvantage, well, you may damage endothelium much more, and especially in harder cataracts, you may have problem with the clarity of media, chance of graft failure, and all those things can occur. So is it different to have a cataract surgery following PKP? Well, it, the surgery may not be very different, but as you can see from this e example, before suture removal, uh, the um, astigmatism of 4.7, post suture removal, 7 diopter. Graph host junction is not healed, endothelial cell density a little poor. So all these things actually complicate the surgery. On top of that, the media clarity may not be the best. So when media is not clear, your visibility is not good. Your unpredictability of IOL power calculation also complicates the issue. So when do we do the surgery? Well, we preferably do the surgery earlier than later, but we have to wait for the topography to become stable. So if topography is stable, we go it. But however, in cases like total cataract, we may have to do a little early. So one such case I'm uh, showing here, a young male who had undergone corneal uh, transplant, laser-assisted corneal uh, transplant, and uh, had uh, developed cataract. Post-cataract surgery, had a diopter 14 of astigmatism on the corneal plane. The problem now is how to tackle this astigmatism. If we do just a cataract surgery, 14 diopter, patient is not going to get anything. Any incisional surgery, ablation, regrafting is out of question. The only thing was that uh, maybe a, a custom toric lens can be implanted. So I went for a custom toric lens, uh, got a 13 diopter cylinder lens. Uh, I always mark my horizontal axis in undilated uh, condition in sitting position after swinging, uh, after putting a thin slit, making it horizontal and swinging it both sides so that it cut, the slit cuts both the pupil and hence it's central. I mark uh, scratch incision on the cornea. I prefer to do these cases under local anesthesia, the uh, post keratoplasty cataracts. Cataract surgery is pretty simple, but it's very important to remember you are dealing with, I'm just finishing, it's last few minutes of this video, ma'am. So, uh, the cataract surgery is pretty simple, but what we are doing is we are trying to take care of the endothelium here. So what type of incision we would prefer? If it's a small graph, I don't mind putting a corneal incision, preferably temporal side because that's where you have the maximum area. Uh, it's more likely to leak, so it's very important to seal these incision with sutures. Scleral tunnel, if it's a large graft and uh, difficult to construct in cases where you have previous ocular surface uh, injury, uh, it's pretty stable incision uh, that way. But previously, if there are glaucoma surgeries done or you're thinking that in the future you may require glaucoma surgery, go for clear corneal one. Always use soft shell technique where you uh, use a dispersive viscoelastic followed by a cohesive viscoelastic uh, agent and uh, use uh, safer uh, um, irrigating solutions like BSS, BSS plus. Your capsular excess can be moderate size to little smaller size so that the IOL does not pop out whenever you are planning uh, surgeries later on. The IOL which I would prefer would be 
hydrophobic acrylic oil because in future if at all you end up uh, doing a desec, uh, an air injection with a hydrophilic lens may not be the best idea. Toric oil, whenever uh, we are um, putting inside uh, um, these eyes, it's very important to make sure that we align the eye oil properly and make sure we remove the visco behind the toric eye oil. Here I'm using a smart toric lens, so I don't need to rotate the lens and hence I'm um, putting the lens in the um, same position. Uh, Post-operatively, uh, the, the care uh, remains uh, same. So, uh, the toric eye oil in cataract surgery following a PKP is indicated when you have uh, our astigmatism which is regular. Also as you can see here I am putting a suture there because now uh, the suture induced astigmatism whatever earlier I would have in my hand it does not behave like that here. So suture induced astigmatism can be quite significantly different. So especially when you are doing a toric eye oil post uh, keratoplasty make sure you put a suture there. Uh, Pre-op and post-op topography of this case remains same. Endothelial count 400 change remains same. I could uh, do a good job there. And post-op you can see significant improvement in the vision, quality of vision. This is uh, pre-op and this is post-op quality of uh, vision. So to summarize, uh, post-PKP cataract uh, surgery, if you want to do toric well, well all sutures should be out. Maximum 6 after, otherwise you need custom toric you should be prepared to do a desec if it fails. Post PK cataract uh, can have a complication like graft failure and in such kind of cases you should be prepared to do either DMAC or if the visibility is not very clear and desec where, where you do not you know, score the decimate membrane, do not remove the previous uh, decimate membrane. So in failed graft uh, post PKP, non decimate stripping endothelial keratoplasty, previous toric oil is there. If previous documented post-peak astigmatism was decent enough and the graph size was smaller. But uh, if the scarring is there, if there is very high suture out astigmatism, in that case you must uh, do a non-toric eye oil. Thank you very much. Thank you Himangshu for this wonderful uh, smart toric one. I have had several ex experiences. So thank you very much audience for a lovely morning session. The next session. <laughs>